Today, the authors of the Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, Elisa Spungen Bildner and Robert Bildner, who have lived in the Berkshires for 35 years and are loyal Northshire customers. Um, so please uh, join us uh, for this great event. And uh, we are gonna be recording this event as Rachel did, but uh, don't worry, only the people who are speaking in the little yellow box and unmuted um, will be recorded. So um, Rob, Elisa, tell us about the book. Great, great. So, uh, we'll take it away. Yes, we are really honored to be here. We are big fans of Northshire Book uh, Bookstore. We were talking about it right before, right before we all started. Um, so, you should all be great fans too. Okay, so, um, so uh, why would you start with the video, Rob? Well, okay, go ahead. Oh, this is, I think you want to. Yeah. So, we'd like to introduce you to some of the farmers and the chefs we interviewed uh, in this cookbook by showing a really short two-minute video, and it gives you a little context about the project. And I'm also going to mention that we're really honored in December when our cookbook was named New England Cookbook of the Year by the Readable Feast, which is a group of prominent writers, chefs, and academics uh, in the Northeast. So Rob, uh, video? Yeah, so I'm going to uh, share a little, we call it a virtual tour of our of our book, if you bear with me, and apologize for not the uh, uh, smoothest transition here, but here we go. In our new book, the Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook. You'll meet some of the remarkable farmers and chefs who play a heroic role in preserving the agricultural community of the area. That is, the Berkshire Hills of Western Massachusetts and neighboring New York, Vermont, and Connecticut. We tell the stories of 42 of them with personal profiles, striking photographs, and 125 kitchen-tested recipes highlighting fresh ingredients, all inspired by or created by these farmers and chefs. The story this book tells and the recipes offer a picture of small family farms that go well beyond this region. This area is a special place, attracting visitors from across the country. It's known for its homegrown food and farm to table tradition, as well as its world-class scenery and culture. The mission of our book, The Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, is to highlight the people, places, and things that make this region so special and the stories of small family farms. The dedicated farmers and farm-to-table chefs we write about are committed to producing food that is tastier and healthier than what's often found in the supermarket by maintaining healthy soil and farming and producing food sustainably. And as importantly, the meat farmers we interviewed are consistently concerned with treating their animals humanely. It's tough to do this work. The farmers we interviewed are motivated to farm for environmental, social, political, health, lifestyle, and even spiritual reasons, often sacrificing a comfortable living for their values. Who could foresee when we began our journey four years ago to write the Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook that its mission to inspire consumers to buy local would be more important than ever when it came out in May 2020. During this time and beyond, we need to support these hardworking and principled people. Our book, website, and Facebook page suggest ways you can buy their products even now. I'm Rob Bildner. And I'm Elisa Spangen Bildner. Our new cookbook, The Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, sheds light on the farmers and the farms of the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New York. Thanks so much. Yeah, so um, I, I should also note that the um, farmers, uh, our book also includes farmers uh, from Vermont, and we'll talk about them. I'd like to add that Berkshire celebrity chef, Brian Alberg, who currently owns the break room at Greylock Works in North Adams, created most of the recipes in our book inspired by what the farmers grow or raise. And while this is a book focused on the Berkshires, Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, the message and the recipes are universal and not dependent on geography. So first, a little background about us that goes beyond the video. 
We have been uh, part-time residents of the Berkshires for 35 plus years. While we both trained as lawyers, most of our professional career has been in the food business. I'm third generation. My grandparents founded a supermarket chain in New Jersey, King Supermarkets, and I ran two food companies that distributed fresh produce and specialty foods to help farmers bring their products to market. Our son, Rafi, who graduated from the Cordon Bleu before going to college at Yale, is a master artisanal pizza chef operating under the brand name Hilltown Hot Pies. And his brother, Ari, ran a craft brewery and consults in the wine business, comprising the fourth generation. After we sold our companies, I studied photography. I photographed the farms, farmers, and chefs in the book. Elisa, a former journalist and journalism professor, and a trained chef with a master's in nutrition, ran another one of our companies that produced value-added produce. So um, Rod didn't mention, but I actually got my start in the food business growing up in Chicago, where I was a bagger um, at Chicago area grocery stores. Um, again, we'll discuss the cookbook in a second, um, but I wanted to just a short uh, check-in among all of us about our current food buying habits. And I know that you know we're not running into stores, but if you can, just raise your hand and I'll be able to see you. Um, that would be really helpful. So first question, when you shop for food normally or even now, um, if you have a choice, do you specifically look for organic? So raise your hand if that includes you. This is great. I know I'm talking to Vermont and upstate New York people, of course. How about food that's, um, if not certified organic, food that's designated local? Raise your hand if that's extremely important to you. I love it. And finally, sustainable, which is not a specific designation, but an idea. Got that too. Great. I truly love this. So we're on the same page. And I've been an organic shopper forever. Um, my hand was up on that one. But our son, Rafi, uh, would argue with me for years um, that you buy local first, and then particularly local and sustainable, and then uh, certified organic. And that's really where I've come out as well. And happy to talk further about these designations later. Um, we can do the Queen, a Q&A, &A, whatever. And you'll see why, for me, buying local and sustainable absolutely trumps everything else. Um, I'm also going to mention that we I've spent the day actually talking to a bunch of farmers. So I'm happy to update at the end um, a lot of our profiles in the book um, about how the farmers have fared this particular season and what they're thinking about going into the spring. So our cookbook's goal is to help readers create great foods, but its other objective is to really show why we should all be buying and eating locally grown and raised food. Again, wherever you are, and to urge everybody to know, no matter what you're buying, where your food is from, um, who's making it and how it's made, especially when you're not buying local too. To give you a flavor for the book, um, Rob and I, as mentioned in the video, are gonna tell a bunch of stories about farmers we've profiled. And this will give you more ins insight into why it's so important to buy local and sustainable um, and certified organic as well. And why you should support you know, our local farms that surround us. And we're really lucky where we live that we have this option and, and we certainly have it now um, as well. Quick note on how we ended up writing this book. Uh, we were inspired to jump into this project when Rafi, who's the youngest of our four kids, we've talked about him, started gardening our Beckett, Massachusetts backyard each summer. He'd sell his produce in front of our house on a little you know, table, whatever, with an on your honor cash box. And then he went to for a semester to the Mountain School in Versha, Vermont, which is a working organic farm that teaches high school juniors how to farm. So the following two summers, he came back to Beckett and transformed his garden into October Mountain Farm, which is was an intensively cultivated and sustainable half acre spread of lettuce, tomatoes, and, and frankly, more exotic veggies. And he sold them all over the area at farmer's markets. And we used to visit Rafi at, at these markets and we'd marvel at his, you know, red rush kale and his, you know, whatever, green beans, whatever he was selling. But we were incredibly aware as his parents of the long hours and the grueling work it took to get those products to his customers. On Friday nights, we're sitting down for dinner he was working through the night, uh, harvesting his crops, washing and processing them to get them ready to sell at the all important Saturday farmer's market. And occasionally he was lucky and a friend of his would help. And I remember one friend who was absolutely exhausted after like a couple days, semi-jokingly asked Rafi if under union rules, uh, he could get a break. At these markets, we met local farmers and we're moved by their stories of how they came to farm, their challenges, their commitment to the soil, to the environment, to producing clean, healthy food, and of course, food that tastes good. As one farmer we interviewed, Amelia Conklin of Skyview Farm in Sheffield, Mass, put it, quote, 
anybody that's eaten a carrot that's fresh and local and grown organically or sustainably versus a carrot that's traveled 1200 miles or more knows the taste is just so, so different. We thought a cookbook based on what the Berkshires grows and raises would offer one way to support these local farmers who are often hidden from view, who may not intersect with our, our own lives, but our people bring us food they lovingly produce and often at a great financial sacrifice. So Lisa grabbed her MacBook Pro, I grabbed a digital recorder, my Nikon, and we traipsed down relatively untraveled dirt roads to interview farmers in their fields while they harvested their watercress or fed their pigs. We said in the video it was four years. I'm telling you, it was more like seven <laughs> uh, with a little time off. But um, anyway, first story I want to tell is Hawk Dance Farm. Um, the night before we visited, the owners, Damon and Diane, just finished a dinner of beet pancakes. And beets are just one of 90 crops that they produce. Um, totally opposite, they have a three acre farm, totally opposite of, you know, big ag, where, uh, which is based on monoculture and raises soybeans or corn over and over on the exact same soil. Um, they have a whole bunch of recipes that were inspired, uh, Diane and Damon inspired, I'll just mention, I mentioned the beet uh, potato pancakes or beet latkes, roasted baby turnips, um, mashed cauliflower with chives, a whole bunch were inspired by their farm. So their farm's in Hillsdale, and that's about 120 miles from Queens, which is where Damon and Diane started. Um, he was a house painter, she was a vet tech, she owned a pet sitting business, and they were really moved by Back to the Landers, Scott and Helen Meering, and Elliot Coleman, an organic advocate. And they moved upstate to start hawk, bands, hawk dance. And, and when they found the property that they were ultimately gonna buy, they saw these two hawks, uh, male and female, going up in the air, mating um, in a dance above the farm. And that was how the farm got its name and why they bought the property. They farm sustainably, which means they don't use chemicals, pesticides, herbicides. They go way beyond USDA's organic certification, um, caring about the environment. They barely till the soil. Uh, No-till farming allows the soil to retain carbon or organic matter, which is better in the soil than in the atmosphere. They're adamant about living to their ideals, being in tune with the earth. They use organic non-GMO seeds. And as Diane says, we believe in supporting that kind of food because I don't want to be a genetic experiment and I don't want my customers to be either. And then she says, everything we grow is done with such care and such love. We want people to feel that when they eat it, um, they get that love. We want them to feel when they eat our tomatoes, the joy we feel when we eat them. And frankly, how hard it took us to get those tomatoes to grow to that state. One of their customers run on Facebook. Let me know when you have more cherry tomatoes. Lucy and I ate all ours in like an hour today. Um, like so many farmers we interviewed, their story isn't an easy one. It took years of farming before they finally made $3,000 in profit after years of farming. They acknowledged they had a romantic vision of farming, which they quickly learned was flawed. It's really hard, Damon says, and we didn't have an emergency fund um, in case things went wrong. When we met the pair, Damon, who's incredibly resourceful, had jury rigged an old washing machine and turned it into a commercial vegetable washer and spinner. And when he can, he paints houses off season, um, although there's really no off season anymore, which is a whole different subject. And the two of them craft beeswax candles, which they sell at craft fairs. Um, and like almost all the farmers we interviewed, they do have to work off farm in order to survive. Yet when we said to Diane, you glad you did this? Diane said, absolutely. We followed our dream. And even if we're not getting rich, at least we can say we've done what we believed in and we're gonna to continue to do so. The second story we'd like to tell you is about Moon in the Pond Farm, which is in Sheffield, Mass, and inspired recipes uh, such as farm hash with poached eggs and lamb ragu and a bunch of other great recipes. Farmer Dominic Palumbo hasn't stopped loving the idea of farming ever since he was a seven-year-old cultivating seeds in his basement. In 1991, he began Moon in the Pond, accessed off a dirt road in the southern Berkshire Hills near the Appalachian Trail. In keeping with his continual interest in teaching about farming, through hikers trekking on the trail between Maine and Georgia can check out a day or two of farm life and eat well at the same time. His farm's emphasis is on producing meat from heritage breeds as well as growing heirloom vegetables, which he sells through a CSA, farmer's markets, and to restaurants. Heritage breeds are traditional livestock breeds, heirloom veggies, old-time varieties. 
heritage and heirloom varieties are the antithesis of big ag's monoculture of hybridized seeds developed only for their hardiness, including their ability to endure cross-country transportation. Dominic's road to farming, like pretty much every Berkshire farmer we spoke to has been tough. In 2016, he faced foreclosure, eventually raising money from large and small donations, catalyzed by a fortuitous tweet from Michael Pollan. For Palumbo, each time he sells at a farmer's market, through the taste of a just pick cucumber, for example, he has the opportunity to help others understand the value of buying good, clean food. That includes meat, which doesn't come from what Palumbo calls, quote, a system that is morally, environmentally, and health-wise bankrupt. We're happy to answer questions about this later, but it was striking to us how humanely the farmers we met treated their animals in great contrast to the conventional agribusiness system. Palumbo was convinced that small farms like his will be the savior of this country's food system, enabling us to be resilient in the face of climate change. Quote, if most of our food comes from the Central Valley of California, he says, you're gonna be in trouble when that becomes either impossible to grow there or impossible to get it from there to here. He loves to cook to the tune of three meals a day for his staff. His philosophy of food, quote, bread and meat and bad should not be inextricably linked. Red meat naturally raised is great for you in balance. Carrots and vegetables are horrible for you if they're raised using bad chemicals and deficient soil. So two more stories, uh, one another farm from Massachusetts and then a farm from Vermont and then a little cooking demo uh, and another, another video uh, depending on our time. So this uh, next farm is Woven Roots Farm, uh, Tearingham, Massachusetts. And we tasted a Woven Roots carrot a couple of years ago for the first time uh, when Jen Salonetti, who's uh, co-owner with her husband Pete of, this, of the farm, pulled out a bunch of, of carrots from the ground, handed us one stalk and said, try it. And we remember that from years ago, sweet and not like anything that we bought in the supermarket since then. Jen is from, is a Bergen County, New Jersey girl and, and husband Pete is a Berkshire guy and they met at UMass Amherst uh, where she studied sustainable agriculture and he studied horticulture. And their property, 10 acres of which they cultivate about one and a half uh, very intensively is down the road from land that Pete took Jen to see when they uh, came back to this area after college. And Jen remembers saying to Pete, they looked over the Tiringham Valley, which is one of the most beautiful areas and said, who owns all this land? This is where I wanna live someday. And that's where they are. Um, Jen and Pete, like many of the farmers we interviewed, including Damon and Diane, who we spoke about earlier, are known for their commitment to no or low-till farming and barely, barely turning the soil over. Um, the Selenetti's farm completely by hand. Again, goes way beyond organic. This is about sustainability. We asked if these features of their farming are part of their sales pitch for woven roots. And Pete said, you know, we've never needed to make a sales pitch. Um, I think people can just feel the difference energetically when they eat what we grow and they taste it. Their food is different, he says, because of the care they put in each square foot of soil. And so many other farmers said that, including John and Joy Primer of um, Ponal, Ponal, who will discuss, uh, we'll discuss them in a moment in their farm. Um, so that difference in what a sustainable farm produces is even recognized by kids, including the Salonetti's kids. Um, not a group of kids are not a group you think would um, be fussy about the taste of produce. And at one point early on, the family became known for giving their prized carrots they're diversified, they grow a lot of things, but their carrots are very well known till uh, they give it to their children's friends as presents. And Jen recalls a birthday party, twin boys, they were getting tons of sports gifts and all of a sudden he came upon the Salonetti's gift, which was a carrot snack pack. And one of the boys stood up on a picnic table, this is Jen telling us, holds up the carrots and yells, yay, carrots. And we were recently, uh, over the summer, we did a book signing at the farm at Woven Roots. And we actually met the, uh, the kid who said, yay, carrots, and, and his mom who were at the farm. And that was really uh, exciting for us to meet some folks that we, grown up we had, who have who've grown up and we've heard the story for years. Uh, so the last story we'll tell is about a farm that's maybe a little more local to Manchester. Uh, it's, it, it's in Manchester, Vermont. It's the Wildstone Farm in Pawnall. It's owned by the Primers, John and Joy, absolutely lovely people. And all their farm, although their farm is a diversified, certified organic farm, 
They specialize in growing garlic. They taught us a lot about garlic and again, why buying local matters. You won't see the kind of garlic they raise, both the quality and diversity in most large supermarkets. We, we think of garlic as garlic, but the Primrose website lists 12 varieties they grow from Carpathian to Georgian Crystal to name two. Joy tells us her favorite depends upon what she's cooking because they all have different flavor profiles. Some garlic, she says, is better eaten raw and some better cooked. We think of garlic as common, but it turns out it's not an easy vegetable to grow. Its season is long. John and Joy plant it in late October and don't harvest their main crop until mid-July and then still need to leave it in the greenhouse to dry. They grade their garlic by size and quality, he believes theirs has more nutritional value because of the kind of attention they pay to the soil and to the seeds, which are their own. John and Joy are fiercely committed to organic and also operate their farm as sustainably as possible using solar power, water drawn from a spring below their house and mainly hand tools to work the land. When we buy from local farmers like Joy and John, we're buying from people who passionately care about their land, the health of the soil, their crops, and the community. While the primers eat off their farm, Joy says, quote, oh, I don't think we bought a vegetable and you know, since we've been here. When they do buy, they're adamant about buying and supporting local purveyors like Cricket Creek Farm in Williamstown, which makes cheese, and High Lawn, the dairy farm in Lee Mass. Another point to make, in my previous life operating a globally sourced produce distribution company, we bought garlic from California, Mexico, South America, and Asia. Think about the amount of energy we consume in shipping, flying, and trucking that garlic all over the world, and then reshipping it to supermarkets up and down the East Coast. When you buy garlic from local farmers like Joy and John, you, yourself, are acting sustainably helping the environment and buying from people who care about what they offer. As John told us, quote, this may sound weird, but that the love we put into our work and the care for our land somehow comes out in the produce. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the farmers. And now we're gonna speak a little bit about the cookbook because after all, this is a cookbook. And hopefully after hearing some of these farmer stories, and I know I'm talking to um, an audience that uh, you know already already feels um, very much of, uh, like this. Um, Rob, you can go back to- uh, Sure. Okay, hold on one second. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah go. Um, so I, I know I've, I've spoken a lot about this, but um, uh, hopefully, just go back a little bit further. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry, so uh, I, I know that so many of you feel this way, but hopefully from hearing some of these stories, you will realize, you know, of course, even more how important it is to buy local, the taste of the products, um, the environment, again, that's the whole nut about sustainability, the soil, the air, land that's safe from development, uh, community that's supported by these farms, even better nutrition, because when things aren't basically schlepped across the country, the nutrition stays in the product a lot longer. Um, and of course, about the animals, which we didn't, talk about specifically these farms, although we're happy to do so because the humane treatment of animals is so important. There was an article in the New York Times today about, um, uh, I don't read this Washington Post, I apologize, about um, meat purveyors and meat processors in the Midwest, and it was pretty horrifying. Um, I'd like to spend a few moments describing the cookbook's philosophy. Our recipes are purposely accessible, and I'm gonna quote Florence Fabricant from the New York Times who featured the book, simple, uh, what makes each dish really work, and it's true of cooking, is that if you use the best ingredients, you will make incredible food. And again, choosing local, fresh, sustainable is your first option. Each recipe, as we mentioned, highlights an ingredient grown or it's raised um, on a particular farm. If they inspire the recipe, the ingredients are not esoteric. Um, but one of our messages is frankly to adventure beyond local carrots, beyond kale, you know, great as they may be, try that rutabaga. I'm thinking about winter, some of the winter vegetables. Try that rutabaga that's in the produce bin of the supermarket. Hopefully it's local. And uh, like me, you probably walk by it a million times. And again, this is the perfect time during the winter to try some of this. Um, and uh, hopefully you will see local in the supermarkets. Again, look for root uh, vegetables. Another cookbook message, um, be flexible. So uh, Bridget Spann, who's one of the owners, owners of Caretaker in Williamstown, Massachusetts, 
uh, when we spoke to her said, you know, be open to making substitutions. And she told us this story where she uses recipes just as a framework, which many of us do. And then she expands off of them, depending what she has available on her farm. So she told us that there was a moosewood chili recipe that she really loved. And she happened to have a ton of kohlrabi uh, sitting around. That's one of those other vegetables that we tend not to use so often, but it's a great vegetable. Um, and she went online and looked to see if anybody had stuck kohlrabi and chili. And guess what? She found that, in fact, they did. And that inspired our recipe, which is a great winter recipe for uh, bean chili. But if you can't find kohlrabi, then you can use broccoli stems and, frankly, a whole lot else not to worry. Um, we're going to switch to a, let's see, looking at our time, and we can do it, a short video, mm -hmm. um, which talks about a pizza recipe from her book. And while it's based on summer ingredients, the point of this video is twofold. One is that you can create the best food from using fresh ingredients, and you'll see that from the video. And frankly, that you can change up a recipe like the one we're showing you and have it come out terrifically just by using whatever's available in season. So, you know, again, put whatever toppings you want on your pizza, um, but fresh and local. Want to show it? Yeah. And okay. uh, we're going to share the video and uh, just bear with me. I'm sorry. Go. Hi, I'm Melissa Spangen Bildner, and I'm the author with my husband Rob Bildner and in collaboration with Chef Brian Albert of the Berkshire's Farm Table Cookbook, which has 125 recipes inspired by the farms of the Berkshire Hills of Western Massachusetts, New York, Vermont, and Connecticut. I'm here with my son, Rafi Bildner, who's Hello. a master pizza chef and who inspired us to write this book because of his foray into farming a number of years ago. Yeah, so thanks, Mom. We're going sure, to, uh, it's an honor to be here with my mother and the author of this amazing, co author of this amazing book. We're going to show a simple pizza recipe from the book that you uses uh, the bounty of the summer growing season here in New England. Uh, we just picked up the zucchini from Woven Roots Farm from our CSA, a farm featured in their book. We have these beautiful local cherry tomatoes, some red onions, some local basil, dairy. Um, this is an unbelievably rich agricultural area, and a pizza is a perfect canvas for that, uh, that beautiful farm bounty. So I'm going to just, it's a simple zucchini and uh, cherry tomato pizza. I'm going to throw some cherry tomatoes, some sliced red onion, some zucchini, uh, a little olive oil uh, in a uh, bowl here just to mix up, a little salt, some ground uh, black pepper, and, and pizzas are simple. Don't go crazy here. Um, we want to literally just let the ingredients each sing for themselves on the pizza, so we don't need to have an overly complicated uh, pizza. And I think your recipe in this book really just uh, does that. Super simple. Super simple, and we're going to use a dough that I made. I do a sourdough crust. You can go to your local pizzeria to get uh, dough if you're not comfortable making it at home. We have an easy recipe in the book, but I stretch this in a lot of flour here. We want to make sure the pizza is sliding around a lot. That's where people get into trouble um, making pizzas at home. And uh, I'm going to top this with these ingredients that we just tossed in the bowl, some local ricotta, mozzarella from a farm just to the north of us here, uh, and um, we want every ingredient going onto the pizza now to be perfectly spiced and ready to go. Uh, we don't want to be layering so many different complicated ingredients. We want to keep this really simple. So I'm going to switch go spots on. with you, Mom. Um, sure. One home pizza making tip I'll give is we want to let gravity do the work when we're stretching that out. As you said, I let, as you saw, I just let the dough fall nicely and, uh, and stretch itself. And I'm gonna get this in the oven with a little ricotta, mozzarella, as I said. Um, throw these ingredients on and just put them all over the pizza. This beautiful local zucchini, the cherry tomatoes, and local mozzarella, and pop it in the oven. And mom, while I'm having it in the oven, you wanna talk a little bit more about sure. uh, why you wrote the book? Sure. So we wrote the book because we wanted to show that you can have the most extraordinary food if you use really fresh, preferably from you know local sustainable farms, which is what our book, uh, our recipes are inspired by. I'm just going to hold up just so you can see. This is another recipe from our book. Yeah, I can hold it up uh, closer. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Gorgeous. This is a chilled melon and mint soup. It takes maybe 15 minutes to make, 20 minutes to I'll make. I'll say with some local wildflowers, Absolutely. edible wildflowers on the rim here. And again, our idea was to make to create or have accessible recipes that again sh uh, they shine because of the ingredients, using when you can fresh and local. And also in doing this book, we wanted to tell the story of the farms that inspired the recipes, but the farmers that we met in our, our journey around this area, learning what this area produces, and wanted to show you how hard they work, how extra extraordinary things they do to preserve the environment, and at the same time 
giving us the most incredible bounty, most beautiful food. And the recipes are very easy. I mean, you, the, the, for the most part, there's maybe one or two there a little harder. Yeah, a pizza, so easy. a pizza is one of the more complicated yes. ones. But again, you can buy dough from a local pizzeria if you don't want to make dough at home. And what I'm doing now is obviously with this gorgeous wood-fired oven behind us. Um, but uh, you could obviously use a pizza stone at your home oven. Um, you could uh, use a baking sheet if you don't have a pizza stone. And uh, I'm just turning this pizza a little bit just to give it even coloration on all sides. This is cooking much quicker than it would in your home oven because it's at 800 degrees and it's a wood-fired oven. And uh, it's just about out. But I want to encourage you to think of making a pizza as you'll see when this comes out. We're not flattening the dough. We're not rolling the dough. We're just moving the air around from the side, from the middle of the crust to the outside. And that's how you get these gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful crusts that are really airy. And uh, the cornicione, the crown of the pizza, as we call it, is beautiful. So we're gonna dig into this. Absolutely. And uh, any final words, mom, that you wanna say sure. about? I'm gonna just uh, suggest that if you wanna find out more about the cookbook and more about how you can produce these extraordinary recipes and about farmers' lives, um, check our website, berkshiresandbeyond.com. We hope to see you there. And we will cut this up and enjoy a beautiful bite of this uh, cherry tomato in zucchini uh, pizza inspired by the local farms in this agriculturally uh, rich region. Right. So this is, I should say, inspired by Berkshire Bounty Farm, one of the most beautiful farms in the area. Very small, prolific. Awesome. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Thanks. Okay, so um, we're now going to switch to uh, a little food demo and. Uh, Take it away. Uh, let's see. Okay. Sorry. Can you switch me over? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So while Rob is doing that, I'm just going to mention that um, we think about we can't buy local now. We think that it's um, impossible to do because it's the winter. No, but sir. honestly, farmers, right? I was speaking to them today. They are all, I can't say all, but most producing uh, products as we speak. Um, many of them have are really a nine to twelve month operations. And one of the ways that you can even get ingredients like some of the ones used on the pizza, uh, like tomatoes, that you know clearly aren't grown in the ground right now, but you know could be grown, um, you know, in, in greenhouses or can be grown in, in urban farms. Um, and I very often buy tomatoes from from urban farms, um, as well as lettuces. Uh, so I mention this because there's all kinds of farming, and again, the idea is to buy local and not to buy from you know across the world. So just a few a few moments here. So I'm going to just uh, show you. This is a dairy recipe. Uh, you can easily get this from a local dairy. It's a chocolate ganache. All right, Rob, it's back on the video. Okay. Uh, it's a chocolate ganache. Um, very briefly, here's how it's made. Uh, it takes some local dairy, and I don't know if you can see this is from Highland Farm, which is a dairy in Lee, Massachusetts, that we mentioned. I uh, boiled some cream with a little bit of vanilla, uh, organic vanilla. And uh, I'm just gonna mention a few things about these ingredients. Um, I use local dairy because it's pasteurized, not ultra pasteurized, pasteurized cream. It retains flavor, retains better bacteria than ultra pasteurized, which is the normal commercial variety you can see in supermarkets. Um, so I can't emphasize enough how important it is to buy local in terms, in terms of uh, dairy. Um, I also use, um, the, uh, I use chocolate chips and I pour the boiled, um, uh, cream and vanilla over chocolate chips. And I, I happen to use ones that have stevia, so I don't use sugar. Um, this recipe has absolutely no sugar in it if you use that, but you can uh, you, you can see that there are other uh, chocolate chips that you can use. And here's one here of a chart. Um, Rob, you just, I can't see. You look at the camera. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so on chocolate chips, you can use, they're dark chocolate chips. You can use any kind you want. You can use chocolate bars. Um, I don't find, frankly find it makes that much of a difference, although some people really prefer chocolate bars, but you want something with a minimum of its dark chocolate of it, it's got to be 35% uh, cocoa solids. Um, and so that's what I use. And again, so this is the sugarless dessert. I um, pour the uh, cream um, or the chocolate, uh, the cream and the vanilla over the chocolate, melts the chocolate. I add a little bit of organic blueberries, which are here. Um, these are not local, they're Maine, but okay, I consider that local enough. They're organic wild blueberries. Um, dry and put them in a baking uh, dish, which I have here. I prep the baking baking dish by putting parchment on the bottom so that it can easily lift out the product after it's cold. Which um, after I do this, I put it in the, the pan, put it in the refrigerator for about an hour. It gets cold, it gets solid. Don't put it in the freezer. It doesn't work that way for ganache. 
and I have a dish that literally is a fantastic dessert that takes about 50 minutes. But the key to it, to me, is using the local dairy. I can't emphasize that enough. I have a few other things I want to show you that I have out here. They won't show you in terms of making, but I'll just mention because they're all things that can be made during the winter, no problem. So one of the things I have here are the beet pancakes, which I mentioned were inspired by Hawk Dance Farm. Uh, the pancakes, I also have uh, rutabaga pancakes here. Um, sometimes people might call them latkes. Uh, often they're done usually with potatoes, but these are done with other vegetables that are really easy to find locally um, during the winter. I mentioned some other things I have here that are also in the cookbook. Here is an apple bread. Um, I happen to have in my refrigerator right now because I went apple picking a couple months ago, bags, literally bags left of local apples. And I use them for months um, to make applesauce, which I also have here, some fresh uh, local apple applesauce, just made with a little bit of cinnamon and nutmeg, no sugar. And I also have some brownies here, which is sort of funny, but again, using local dairy, inspired by a farm called Hawthorne Valley Farm, which is uh, in New York. Um, and they're called camp brownies, some brownies that they created a recipe for based on what they do in their camps, uh, their, their summer camps, which they're known for. So here's a bunch of things. Let me move over back to where I was before. Happy to answer any questions about the cookbook or about uh, the farmers. Yeah, so uh, before we get to questions, um, I did want to, let me move this, sorry. Um, I did want to speak a little bit about buying local and some of the recipes in our book, which maybe um, maybe you want to talk about some of the recipes, which are- Yeah, I'm just going to mention again, you know, people say, well, you know, you're talking about farm to table, that's just summer. Again, I can't emphasize how much it's not just summer. So I mentioned that I'd spoken to farmers all day today for an article I'm writing on, on uh, farming now and farming uh, coming into the spring. And um, the farmers I spoke to, all of whom are still selling, um, you know, what they're, what they're growing or raising. And it's not just the dairy farmers and it's not just the meat farmers who clearly year round. There are vegetable farmers as well. And it takes a little bit of work to find um, to, to find this and maybe contacting the farmers, but please do, Ralph, you speak about that in a, in a, yes. a little bit. But I like oh, to res so recipes, yeah. yeah. So I just mentioned just a few um, off the top of my head. So kale, sausage, and white bean soup, great, uh, great uh, winter recipe. Um, bean soup with smoked pan hock for carrots. I showed you the potato pancakes before. Number of chilies. Um, I've got uh, aligobi, which is an Indian inspired dish made with chicken. Uh, desserts, a whole bunch of quick breads, including parsnip, carrot, pumpkin, and, and I showed you apple bread. There's plenty, plenty to do in the winter. And also uh, sandwiches. We have wonderful uh, three cheese or two cheese grilled cheese. Uh, inspired by our friends at Cricket uh, Creek and a tempeh Reuben. So there are lots of winter recipes. So now I just would like to address before questions, uh, ways you can increase increase your buying local now, even in the dead of winter. So we mentioned the primers of Wildstone Farm. They're happy to sell you some of their products now. They're selling the products now. You can also find locally grown foods by going to website, farmstanding.com. And you enter your location. I entered Manchester, Vermont, for example. It gave me many places where you can buy local now, including a farm 15 miles away, which is Mighty Food Farms, a farm we wrote about in our book. And they have a, a winter CSA going on. They sell their products, such as winter spinach and kale, uh, kimchi and sauerkraut, lots of storage crops, carrots, leeks, um, kohlrabi, turnips, radishes, and more. There's another website. Uh, we recommend localharvest.org. Again, enter your location and it tells you where you can buy local. And it connected me to another one of the farms we wrote about, Square Roots Farm in Lanesboro, Mass, which uh, that sells meat and eggs year round. Our Facebook, web, uh, Instagram, and website page, we are currently in the process of updating it. It's got a lot of information about where you can buy local now and why. I think, Alyssa, you want to interject some say also thoughts that, about your conversations today with local I, I can't, but I will also say that um, for those people who are in New York State, particularly around the Saratoga Springs um, store, again, same thing. You can find local farms you know, there just as well. Um, no problem. The one thing I'll say about the farmers who spoke today, they are doing, they're really, the ones who are not selling to restaurants are doing really well in that they, um, they have a crush of business. But it's a little cyclical, depending on how people feel about the pandemic. Um, but I urge you not to sort of write them off to 
to go find them, check out how you can get their goods, um, because they are still selling, they are still growing, they are, they are still raising. And what's really important, and this is true post-pandemic, this is a message they really told me, they hope that people realize the virtues of buying what they sell, not just now because you know there's sometimes more limited supply, things like that, but really because it's, the re it's really the great way to eat um, and to purchase food. And, and, and to help sustain them. So we hope that if you have any questions, you can contact us at berkshiresandbeyond.com and you've got our Facebook or Instagram, the website for info. And now we're happy to answer your questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks so much, Rob. I, I'm really hungry and I want to make a um, that That was great. I love the videos. There's a, a question to start us off from Carrie. Um, she asks, which are your favorite recipes in the books, uh, in the book, and are there any Vermont farmers included? Well, if it's the Carrie I'm thinking of, hi, Carrie. Yes. Great to have you on. You really, you're truly a trooper. I'm sorry. So you want the your favorite the, recipes? Well, in the Vermont. Well, yes, Vermont. So Vermont farmers, as we said, Wildstone. Uh, primers. Um, the um, Mighty Foods Farm, which is um, in Shaftesbury, which is a pretty impressive farm with uh, basically many varieties of CSAs almost year round. Um, they're they're very, uh, very impressive uh, farmer. Um, they inspired the farm bounty salad. Yeah, uh, many of our great recipes. Yeah. You want to talk about favorite recipes? Go ahead. Sure. So, okay, favorite recipes. Um, I'll tell you something I made this week. Um, it was a mushroom stew. It was. A, we also have recipes inspired by restaurants, and this was inspired by Prairie Whale, um, which is in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and it makes use of some local shiitake mushrooms um, that are grown on logs in a farm in uh, Sanders Field. Um, anyway, it's a wonderful winter, wonderful winter recipe. I use many different varieties of mushrooms. And I just happened to have made it this week. So that's a good example. And one of mine, uh, which Elisa will say, it is a lot of work. We, in our recipes well, are simple, say, right. but, but it is absolutely fabulous and lasts for a long time. It's conf confetti, vegetable, and goat cheese lasagna. It's amazing. It, it's, you know, check out the recipe in our book. It's hearty. It's delicious. It's a crowd pleaser. That's definitely, uh, uh, you know, a, a favorite of mine. Oh, the, the exact name of the recipe that I uh, mentioned before is mushroom ragu over pasta rice or polenta. I also do a whole bunch of stir fries now, some of which were in the, in the book. One inspired by Berkshire Bounty, which I think you mentioned. Again, you can you can you know sub in and out whatever ingredients you the, want. The, we mentioned uh, for now in the winter the kale sausage and white bean soup. It's a great recipe. Now we are not, we're vegetarians and a vegan, but our, our book is filled with meat recipes because it represents what the Berkshires grows and raises. This recipe is both for meat eaters because you use sausage or you can veganize or vegetarianize it with vegan sausage. It's a really delicious, hearty, hearty soup. And, and I should mention, depending on one's eating style or whatever, um, Many of the recipes, if not most, have are given. Uh, we give vegetarian or vegan options if they are uh, meat recipes. And I will just have to say, because we sort of alluded to this a number of times on the issue of meat, um, we personally not, are not meat eaters. So those recipes were developed by Brian and worked on by uh, some professional. We've used uh, professional uh, recipe, recipe testers who did a fabulous job. But the one thing I would say is that if I were a meat eater, I would be buying the food that these farmers um, raise because. Each one of them, the way they treat their animals is so heartwarming. It's, it's, it's so unlike anything that you can possibly imagine um, or that you've read about that goes on on these, you know, in commercial, um, you know, uh, feedlots. It, it just, it would be very difficult for me personally to eat meat from commercial versus local. And, and, um, and one of raisers. our farmers is in actually Williamstown, not too far certainly from uh, Kim Manchester, Wells. Kim Wells, yeah. East Mountain Farm. I have a photo in our book and I mentioned uh, I, I took the photos. It's one of my favorites. It was, Kim, it was in the video, Kim sitting on a stump, gazing with great love for his pigs who are gazing back at him. He is an extraordinary, he's actually a Williams grad and uh, just treats, but we have many stories about uh, our meat uh, farmers in the book. I'm thinking Climbing Tree Farm Climbing tree in New York. In New York, yeah, um, New York State. They have, yeah. they have thought so long yeah. and hard about what it means to be a meat but, farmer. But back to recipes, dessert, yeah. we have great desserts. We've got some really scrumptious. We mentioned some of the uh, parsnip, uh, pumpkin and apple breads, some fantastic 
pies, and there's a maple cheesecake that that's really <laughs> to die for. So there's some really yummy uh, and the ganache, of course. Um, but recipes for all seasons. Pumpkin creme brulee. Yeah. And I'm just going to mention one summer one because I think I made it all summer long because there's right behind this farm, the Picky Round Blueberry, Organic Blueberry Farm, um, glazed blueberry lemon yeah. bread. And actually, I have in my freezer bags of frozen but, blueberries. But again, the book is, is for all seasons. Yeah, uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to chime in about the, the, um, the meat farmers. I, I've heard so many say before that something of the equivalent of they want their pigs to, or their animals to have just a great life and only have like one bad day, um, which I think is funny. But um, I, had a, I had another question for you. The um, farmstanding.com you mentioned and the other website, is that for the entire nation or just in this region? Yeah, yeah it's a great question. It is for the entire nation. And so you literally, uh, you just put in, you know, your location. So if you're traveling uh, wherever you are and it will give you local farmers in the vicinity of wherever you happen to be. Now it's a broad range. I mean, I, I think they go maybe a hundred miles or so from where you are, but I, I just, you know, for, for kicks, I, I, I put in Manchester and it picked up uh, many of our local farms that we wrote about in the book. Um, the wonderful, as we said at the beginning of our presentation, what's been very gratifying to us to find that this message about buying local resonates all across the country. We've done these book talks by now for uh, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, literally all across the country, even in the Midwest, like the heartland of monoculture, big ag, and our message is resonating. They're folks who really buy sustainable, organic, they're farmers who are you know, plugging away, who really care who really see themselves as, um, I don't know, they're, they're like, they're trying to do something better to help, uh, you know, save the planet, to be honest. So it's been very inspiring. Yeah. Um, I'll mention one more thing too, which is um, local organizations that support farmers. And in our area, it's Berkshire Grown, uh, particularly, um, there are a bunch of organizations that support farmers, but that one, um, and they have a full, um, uh, directory. directory of, of farms right. in the area, CESA right. in the Pioneer Valley. And again, wherever you are, there's generally an organization that is, right. uh, is exists, exists to support farmers. So please yeah. check them out as well. And, and departments of agriculture too. Sure. I know, uh, and foundations, private groups are, are really trying to help these local farms. What was the second website you mentioned besides farmstanding.com? Yeah, right? it's localharvest.org. And it's uh, what farm stand, uh, farm standing, farm standing dot com, which is a new one. Yeah. So local there's yeah, and farm standing dot com. Yeah. Um, great. And I, I've got a question for you, Rob. You had um, talked about and mentioned in passing how you were working with food distribution from you know across the world, and then now you're talking about hyper local. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the journey there? Yeah, it's, that's such a great question, and it's, it has been quite a journey. So I started in the early 80s. This um, It began as a specialty uh, produce, a specialty food uh, importation and distribution company, and we actually were one of the first distributors of organic foods at the time. I actually served on the New Jersey Organic Certification Board. Um, and grew that business and we brought in basically 24 seven or, or, you know, throughout the year, um, probably well, thousands of, 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 of perishable food products, including every imaginable type of produce. And we literally imported apple pears from Japan and uh, tomatoes from Israel. And I, we had this, you know, I had a, a, a very large refrigerated warehouse. I had trucks lined up every day coming from California. So I really lived that. I ended, you know, at the time we were satisfying the consumer's demand to have fresh foods year round. But the truth is, as I came to, to this epiphany, that it's not the way to go. It's not the way to go for a planet. It's not the way to go for a healthy eating because these foods literally were trucked across country thousands of miles sitting in these refrigerated trailers, just burning up energy that's just, just tons, you know, of energy. And for what? So we have, you know, 
you know, a certain, you know, fruit year round and you know, flying fruit from Chile and all over the world. So yeah, it was, re it was an epiphany for me to recognize the importance of respecting seasonality for all the good reasons. And frankly, I traveled the world visiting farms and a lot of our farmers, the farmers we work with, we were, you know, many of them were organic farmers. They did care about the environment, but the truth is many of them were very large and frankly, in, in retrospect, I think that, you know, as I said, we were using up too much energy and not probably doing the right thing. Um, you know, it was, it was, it's the conventional food business, that system that we operate in the United States where we're getting all this cheap, generally not nutritious food trucked all over, you know, uh, filling up the fast food pipeline and it's just not the way to go. So anyway, I. I can definitely happy to talk about that at any point. It's uh, it really informed my understanding of why local food is so important. I just want to mention one thing because Rachel, I see that you wrote in the chat um, about uh, farmers markets around Saratoga. I just want to double check: is Space City Farmers Market is that the one in Troy? Oh, you're on. You're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Spa City Farmers Market is in Saratoga. Also, that's the Sunday Farmers Market. Okay. Because there's here. also. There's also um, one that a number of our farmers I know are at in Troy, New York as well. So I guess it's the same, the same group or whatever. So I just want to mention that. Yeah, that, that's also winter, a wonderful one. Yeah, there are winter's farmers markets. And again, I think they're the ones that we've seen are, are being done really carefully. Um, and farmers, again, are, are, are depending on them hugely. You know, I, just going back to your question, and I don't want to uh, take up too much time, but when I sat on the organic certification board, that organic certifications are based on a very, in some ways, kind of an arbitrary principle. You know, it's a naturally occurring chemical. It's okay if it's, you know, synthetic, it's not. And I remember reviewing all these lists of chemicals that we would say, uh, you know, for, for certification were okay or not. And I was, I, it always struck me that it was in some ways a very arbitrary designation, which is why I think sustainable local is just so much more but, but important. I wanna, but I'm glad you said that, Rob, because people sometimes don't really understand um, what organic is, but I wanna emphasize that I would take organic certified Absolutely, a yeah. million times yeah, over, over convention. conventional, sure. would not, totally. not even a, a question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and yes, we get into the issue sometimes of cost because sometimes not all the time it's a higher cost yeah. and we can certainly address yeah. that as well if you'd yeah. like, but yeah. I just, I, I want people to realize that organic. Yeah, oh, totally. If it's no, not, there's no question. I just think we've come a long way. Many certified organic farmers are sustainable as well, yes. even if it's not required by the organic certification uh, yeah. designations. I don't know if you have more questions or what the time is, but. Yeah, we've got a few, few more, a little bit more time. And um, I was going to say, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the um, recipe testing process for making this? Ah, it's, uh, it's actually very relevant because our primary recipe tester is from Burlington, Vermont. So the book has origins in, in, in Vermont. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say that, uh, so the way, <laughs> The way we started, um, I had this very delusional idea, um, although we've written before this was our first cookbook, um, this delusional idea that we would just use our many, many friends who raised their hand and said, I really want to test your recipes. And many of them did, and they were wonderful and did it. But we realized very quickly that that was not the way to find recipes or create recipes that were absolutely foolproof because everybody has different you know, standards, different ways of, of doing their recipes. And you take a collection of people testing recipes um, with a, a being standardized, that's really tough. So we hired a recipe tester in Burlington who worked with a, a, a colleague. So that was two of them, plus a recipe tester um, who's also a, a friend, um, but professional uh, here in, in the Berkshires. And they tested um, each recipe so that they, and then they were, recipes were done also by friends and also done by me and whatever. So they were tested many, many times over, but I wanted to have a certain baseline mm testers who would say yes this works it doesn't work this is how what we have to do play with etc there's nothing more frustrating i'm sure people who are on this call have been have had this experience of opening a cookbook doing a recipe and finding it really doesn't work or that there's a mistake which it's possible in an editing process yes that could happen um, because there's so many you know edited versions of a book but that being said um, there are times that recipes just really aren't I find really aren't tested. And a famous one that I'll just mention is a cookbook in New York of a restaurant that's extraordinarily well known, won't mention it. Um, I used the cookbook, I've used it many times. And there was a recipe that had used called for one tablespoon of salt 
I thought, oh, that is really weird. I mean, that's enough salt to sort of push everybody over. Um, but I did it thinking, of course, it's in, a, it's in a cookbook. That must be right. Well, needless to say, it was wrong. And I had to throw out the whole thing. Of course, it should have been one teaspoon of salt. So to me, that recipe testing, recipe testing is a very honorable and honor to me profession because yeah. you need it. And we had ex many experiences. Of, it was a very rigorous process for our book. Um, we're both lawyers by training, so we, we, we know what it is to proofread. We're really fanatical about getting it right. But we, we you know, and Brian is a fabulous cook, chef. a chef. chef. Um, but there were many times as we went through our recipes that we just couldn't understand why a certain recipe wasn't coming out right. And one of our recipes is actually, I think, the Indian pudding uh, story when uh, we had a little uh, problem where the base, the, the amount of molasses, I think, uh, there was a, a significant mistake, so it was it's just, the editing process it was then. so too, too gooey, it wasn't right, and we realized there was a, a problem in the measure, just, you know, and it took a while of testing, but we got it right, but it's, it's, it's probably the most important part of, you know, making a cookbook work. Well, Robin, Elisa, thank you so much. We are just about out of time. I think there's one last question in the chat from Cheryl, and she's just asking if perhaps you could please name the farms and their locations that you spoke of at the start of the session. Well, the ones sure. we spoke of at the start sure. of the session. Uh, oh, um, I think we spoke with the ones I talked to today, maybe. Um, I talked about uh, Wildstone, which is the one in Pano. Oh, well, in our, yeah. Uh, I spoke about, oh, the ones uh, in Moon in the Pond in Sheffield, Massachusetts. Moon in the Pond, yeah. Um, Hawk Dance Farm in Hillsdale, New York. Hillsdale, New York. What yeah. are the ones that we speak about today? Uh, because we trade off all the time. Um, I mean, uh, to be honest, the best way uh, to give this information, if you go on our website, berkshiresandbeyond.com, we have a little heading for farms. And we actually have a list of all the farms that uh, we write about with their you know, contact information. And, uh, and so that's probably the best way, but the, the farms that we spoke about, I think are the ones that you just mentioned. Yeah, I think there was another one yeah. we spoke about as well, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, um, Woven Roots we spoke oh, about. Oh, Woven Roots Farm in uh, Tearingham, Mass, yeah. 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 Anyway, feel free to get in touch with us, happy to answer yeah, any further yeah. questions, and we're, can't we're, thank you guys enough. We're really honored to keep up the great uh, speak for Northshire. I can't wait to come in and look for books in person sooner but we than we were in person. Well, we, we did go in person, actually. Not that long ago, yeah. we were there. We'll be back. <laughs> Thanks so much. The best way to find out about all the farms is, of course, by buying a copy of the Berkshire's Farm Cookbook, Farm uh, Table Cookbook. Um, okay. Rob, Elisa, thank you so much. This has been lovely. Thank you so thank much. You. It's great, you, really. great honor. And Rachel, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Rob uh -huh. and Elisa. Stay well, everyone. Stay healthy and happy cooking. Bon appetit by everybody. Bye-bye.